lunch today. If you've got one on, on one of these stunning shirts, he's going to have to say something to you about it. The door of opportunity is open. Be contagious. Tell people why you're wearing that stupid shirt. <laughs> you're kicking winter goodbye, and Goshen Christian Church wants you to come. Turn your Bible to Luke chapter 10. Luke 10, starting at verse 25, is a story that probably you might be familiar with. It's often called the Good Samaritan. Okay? The Good Samaritan. I'd like to use it today for the backdrop of the message. Luke 10, starting at verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, A certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among some robbers. And they stripped him and beat him and went off, leaving him half dead. And by chance... A certain priest was going down on this same road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion, and came to him, and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the next day he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and whatever you spend, more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, The one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said to him, Go and do the same. I do not believe that you can be a secret Christian. I don't believe it's possible, if you're really a Christian, to hide that from people. You can't do that. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, then it's got to be evident in your life. And other people have got to see that in you. That's our responsibility, to live a life that magnifies Christ. That's being contagious. And this scripture today about this Good Samaritan, it's also about the priest and the Levite. Two religious people who didn't do what they should be doing. Jesus told this story because he wanted to ask the question, who is your neighbor? The passage concluded this way, with Jesus saying, which one of these three was the real neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? The man answered correctly, the one who showed him mercy. But he was not willing to go and do that. Just like the priest and the Levite were not willing to show mercy either. Are we ever guilty of passing by on the other side like the priest and the Levite? If you don't say yes to that, then you're a liar. Because we all have. We all have seen someone who needed our help and we passed on by the other side. I titled this message, Contagious Heart, because 
We need to have a heart like Jesus. A heart that has compassion for people who are hurting. People who are lost. A contagious Christian will have a contagious heart for others. And will show mercy to people who need it. We, we need to understand that success, money, power, long life, and many other things are not really that important. What's important is the relationship we have with Jesus Christ. No matter how long we live, if we have a relationship with Him, then how long we live really doesn't matter. Because whenever it is that we die, we will be with Him for eternity. We need to think about how Jesus would reach out to people. We need to think about what Jesus would do. You know, Jesus spent His three and a half years ministering here on this earth as an example for you and me. We have many of the things that He did recorded in the Gospels. So that we can see the compassion and, and the, the feeling he had for people who were lost. 1 Peter 2.21 says we should walk in his footsteps. In other words, we should show compassion and mercy to people just like he did. What if we cared about lost people? way Jesus does. That's what we're supposed to do. I want you to consider with me this morning how Jesus would reach out to lost people. They could be and very well be our neighbors. I think, first of all, Jesus would pray for his lost neighbors. Before he went and talked to them, before he carried on a conversation with them, before he invited them to come to church, he would pray for them. I haven't heard in a long time when we ask people who for a prayer request, anybody say, I'd like for you to pray for my lost neighbor, or my lost son, or daughter, or father, or mother. That's what we ought to be praying about. Because if these sick people die, if they know Jesus, they're going to be okay. They're going to be healed. But if a lost son or a daughter or someone that's a neighbor dies without Jesus, they're going to hell. It's lost people we should be praying for. It's not that we shouldn't pray for people who are sick and hurting, but when's the last time you really... Pray for somebody who was lost. I believe Jesus did that. I believe he prayed for people who would be lost. Because he wanted them to be found. That's why he told about the lost coin and the lost sheep and the lost son. Because he wanted us to have a heart for the lost people. Matthew 23, 37, this is the New Living Translation, says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings. But you wouldn't let me. Jesus' heart must break for lost people who won't let him save them. And gather them together like a hen does her chicks. Jesus showed a pattern throughout the Gospels of prayer about everything that he did. He prayed consistently, he prayed specifically, and he prayed fervently for lost people. The question we need to ask is, are we praying for our lost neighbors? 
last week I asked you to be thinking about someone who you could start praying for that you were going to invite on, on Sunday. I hope you started doing that. If you haven't, you, you can still start doing that. Lee Strobel, who's the author of The Case for Faith and several other good books, tells of a woman who he was ready to baptize. Her husband had accompanied her that day to watch her get baptized. Something told Lee to ask her husband this question. Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Right there on the spot. He looked at Lee for a moment and he said in front of thousands of people who were there worshiping that day, No, I haven't. I want to right now. And he was baptized right along with his wife. After the service, a woman came running up to these troubles <coughs> with tears streaming down her face. And all she was saying was, Nine years, nine years, nine years. So he struggled and didn't know, know who she was. So he asked her, Who are you and why do you keep saying nine years? The woman said, That was my brother. I've been praying for his salvation for nine years. Lee remarked later, what if that woman had stopped praying after eight years? That day would have never happened probably. He probably never would have come to watch his wife get baptized. He would never have been baptized either. <laughs> I'll admit to you, I don't know everything about prayer. I'll admit to you, I don't pray as much as I should pray. But I know, do know that people who you pray for have free will. And they can choose for themselves. And sometimes, no matter how you pray for someone, they may never respond. But I also know that God can work in mysterious ways as wonders to perform. Because I've seen it. So if you pray for someone that's lost, don't be surprised. Even after nine years, they come walking down the aisle and they go down into that watery grave. I remember when I was preaching at Flat Rock, a guy by the name of Carl Jones. He, he would come occasionally with his wife and family, but there was one particular day he came, and it was 18 years after his wife had started praying for him. He was immersed in Christ. So don't ever give up praying for somebody who's lost. Mother Teresa said this. She said, when I pray... Coincidences happen. And when I stop, they don't. They don't happen. She believed there was value in praying to God. And so do I. I believe Jesus would pray for his lost neighbors, and I believe we need to also. I also believe that Jesus would always be open to questions. I can't think of a single time in, in the gospel accounts of Jesus' ministry where he ever turned anyone away who was asking him a question. And sometimes he was interrupted in something he was doing, but still he took the time minister to that person, to answer that person's question. <coughs> I 
one time John the Baptist identified Jesus as the Lamb of God when Jesus was walking towards him, coming down the road. And John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And right after that, right after John baptized Jesus, he heard a voice from heaven crying out, Behold, that my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased. Now you'd think that would be enough <coughs> to really make, a, make John the Baptist understand who this was. It wasn't too long after that, John the Baptist was arrested, put in prison. And he began to doubt. And you know, sometimes when we find ourselves in a, in a difficult situation, we probably may doubt a little bit too. But. And so John the Baptist, he sent two of his disciples to ask if Jesus really was the Messiah or if they should start looking for somebody else. That was a good question that was asked of Jesus. So how did Jesus handle John's question? He didn't criticize John for asking the question. He didn't say, oh, you of little faith. No, he, he told those two disciples of John, look at what you're seeing. Look at the people who are being healed. Listen to the message that you're hearing. And go back and tell John what you've seen. In fact, this is Luke 7, 22. Go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. In other words, Jesus told the two men to go back to John the Baptist and tell him of the evidence that they had seen <coughs> and heard. Jesus didn't think any less of John the Baptist for his question. In fact, just a few chapters later, in Matthew 11, 11, Jesus says of John the Baptist, there was no one ever born of a woman greater than John the Baptist. <coughs> it's okay to ask questions. A Christian, as a Christian, I'm expected be ready to give an answer for why I have hope, for what I believe. Jesus even gave us the promise <coughs> that the Holy Spirit would give us the words to say. We need it. That doesn't mean we should try to prepare ourselves to give an answer, to be ready to give an answer. The Holy Spirit will give us the right words at the right time. The good news is that we have truth on our side. And not only that, but the Holy Spirit can help us. We need to be prepared to give an answer for our faith at all times. And if we're not prepared, we just might become an obstacle that hinders someone else from knowing Jesus. And so it's imperative for us to know the truth as best we can, be prepared to give an answer to people when they have questions. I believe that's what Jesus would do, and I believe that's what we need to do. There's one more thing I believe Jesus would do for his neighbor, the people that are lost. He would show people that his faith was authentic. He would show people that his faith was authentic. And that's what we need to do. Jesus didn't go around quoting John 3.16 all the time, although he could. Instead, he went around showing John 3.16. Because he was a servant. And he ministered to people. He loved people lost people all the way to the cross where he was crucified again. 
Remember what he said when he was on the cross? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. For Jesus, love was a verb. It was something that you do. It was something that you give. When we show people our love in tangible ways, their heart is open and it becomes an opportunity to give an answer to why we believe what we believe. Matthew 5.15 says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The problem is, too often, we're claiming to be a Christian, but people are seeing what we're doing as not good, <laughs> but bad. We become a good. In the Greek, in this verse, verse 15, Matthew 5, the word good means winsome or attractive. Jesus is telling us that we must serve others in a winsome and attractive way. A way that makes them want what we've got. Makes them want to give glory to God. There needs to be consistency between what we believe and what we do. Between our belief and our behavior. If there is not a consistency there, people will think we are hypocrites because we will be hypocrites. Because our walk has got to match our talk. And if we haven't walked the walk, they probably won't listen to our talk. In fact, few things repel non believers more than Christians who are not authentic. And don't you think they can't see right through you? We have to be real. We have to be authentic. We have to be Jesus to other people. Hypocrisy in Christians can hurt the church, <coughs> the church's reputation and witness more than anything else. You and I don't have to be perfect. But we do have to be real and authentic. There, there are too many people, really, who've had a bad experience at church. Or have had a bad experience with, with, with Christians. <laughs> and so they won't go back into the door of the church. And that's a shame. And that's, that, that's bad on our part. Because we're not being the bride of Christ. We're not being the church that he wants us to be. A church that welcomes people. A church that's open to different people. A church that people are authentic and genuine. We have to communicate authenticity to people. They must see the love of Christ coming from us. We have to become more like Jesus in what we say and in what we do. That's developing a contagious faith and having a contagious heart. Jesus came to save sinners. And now he uses us to do that. He has given us that mission to save sinners. Of which we once were one. And so we know what it's like not to know Jesus. We can either be a help to him in fulfilling his mission of saving the lost, or we can be a hindrance. <coughs> We also have to remember something that 
Jesus didn't come to save our physical bodies. He came to save our souls. So no matter what happens to our physical body, if he saved our soul, we're all right. Whether our physical body lives a long time or a short time doesn't really make much difference. I don't know about you, I want to live a long time, but not know Jesus, <clears throat> live a long time, is a tragedy. If we have a contagious heart, not only will we live for eternity, but we can't help be contagious and affect other people along the way. Right now we're going to sing an invitation to him. And I want you to think about Jesus. And I want, I want you to think about what he would do, what he would say about the lost people that you know. What would he have you do with those lost people that you won't know? What would he have you say to them? Would you be an authentic Christian? Would you accept their questions? Help them to know the answer is Jesus. I hope you will. This morning we're going to stand and sing an invitation song. It's an opportunity for you to be immersed in Christ.